This is the e Podcast, episode number 89. I think we need to redefine or clarify what we mean by reward. Mm-hmm. Because strictly speaking, reward means feedback. I take an action, I get a reaction. Um, and so that piece of rewards, I love. If we can focus more on how we deliver good quality feedback in a timely fashion, I'm all in. Welcome to the eLearn Podcast. My name is Laddick, and I'm your host from OpenLMS. My guest for today is Valerie Olinik, who can be found at ValerieWithAY.com. She self-describes herself as the chief disruptor, wherever she goes, to work on gamification, creative problem solving, and helping people rethink their learning design challenges. In this snappy conversation, Valerie and I discuss when gamification became a thing for her in days past when she was working in corporate learning and when she proposed a research project about gamification and was told there isn't enough out there to do it. We also talk about the key reasons why gamification works, like the ongoing challenge, the ability to fail and try again, and why you should consider playing games as a way to build this muscle into your design. Valerie and I also discuss how you can move beyond designing things so that they aren't unbearable for your learners to something that learners care about and actually have meaning. And Valerie also shares some key tips for gamification design success, like making sure that progress is always visible in some way, breaking things into small uh, achievable steps, randomizing questions, resources and rewards, giving choice and reminding learners where they've been as well as where they're going. And then finally, we talk about why rewards aren't all bad or all good and how designing for your specific situation or audience, think relevance, makes all the difference in reward effectiveness and how the hallmark of a good scenario is whether or not you want to play more than once. And just a note about the format of this episode, I've started to move all interviews to a live format so that we can interact with you, our listeners. In this episode, you'll hear Valerie and I answer questions as they come in via chat messages. I invite you to join us every Thursday on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. Now, before we get started, a quick word from our sponsors. The eLearning Podcast is sponsored by the eLearn Success Series, a uniquely valuable set of events that bring together sector experts and thought leaders to offer solutions to the most critical challenges and issues at the intersection of education and technology. Get your free ticket to all four sessions at eLearnSuccessSeries.com. And Open LMS a company that provides world-class LMS solutions that empower organizations to meet education and workplace learning needs. Learn more by visiting openlms.net. Valerie, hello, how are you today? I am awesome. I am awesome. I, yeah, it's, very, it's, very, it's very toasty in this hot seat. It's good, <laughs> good to be here. <laughs> uh, where do we find you sitting? Uh, today I am physically in New Jersey. Uh, so it's a little chilly here. I could use some. I could use some warmth. It's a little. Mm. It's, uh, it's still a little wintry here. So I, ha- I have to ask: Is it? Is it? I mean, is it Philadelphia, Jersey, or is it New York, Jersey, or or are you in the Bruce Springsteen, Jersey? Which one are ooh, you? Oh, I mean, oh, that's a good one. It, it's not the Philadelphia, New Jersey. It's it's mm. the new. It's it's the uh, until you know until the whatever that you know whatever that thing is that happened you know that pandemic thing. Yeah. I was yeah I was a I was in New York every day. So I I'll claim the. I lived in Manhattan for many, many years. So I'll claim the New York side. I, I got I had the privilege to live in Hoboken for a couple of years. There you go. And you know, saw Frank Sinatra's house and all that good stuff. Nice. Well, you had a better view of New York than people who live in Manhattan do. Yeah, it's true. It was really <laughs> nice. It was really nice. Um, Valerie with why I have, you know, as we do with uh, on all of these conversations, um, I'd love for you to give us who are you and what do you do? Um, why don't you take the, you know, the 30 to 60 seconds and just sure. say, what, what, what's your, what's your stick? What's my stick? My stick is I am, I am the chief disruptor everywhere I go. Um, mm. So, you know, lots of, uh, lots of work in the gamification space, lots of work in the creative, um, creative space, creative problem solving, um, have some, have some cool projects coming up with that soon. Um, doing a lot of conference run around talking at a lot of conferences, getting a chance to hear what's going on, hear what people are challenged with, and uh, hopefully giving them some insights and some suggestions on different ways to do things that they might not have considered. I, uh, I sort of, uh, 
I, I jokingly say I get paid to think mm. uh, and help people rethink, I think is probably more to the point. That is fantastic. I love it. I, I mean, if, if, if there's a job to aspire to, get paid to think and help people rethink, right? Yeah. So. Um, and you and I are going to talk about gamification today. When did you stumble into the gamification game? Like, like when, when did that light bulb turn on for you? It's been like, I, I actually, as, as, as some of us, some of us in the, in the space have been saying, we were doing it before there was a word for it. Like we didn't, we were doing it. We didn't realize we were doing it. Mm -hmm. um, we were just, I mean, one of my big mantras is always learners deserve better. And I don't mean like we're doing a bad job, but we need to constantly, you know, we're, we're trying to get learners to change behavior and sometimes we don't take our own medicine. And so it's always, you know, what could we be doing to, to go to that next level? Are we really doing the best thing for the learners um, or just kind of what's easy for us? Cause we've been doing it and we, you know, we feel kind of, we get a little comfortable. Mm -hmm. So that's why I kind of, you know, nudge people a little bit out of their comfort sometimes. But the gamification thing was really just, I saw, I was not happy with what I saw in the corporate training space. I was doing technical training. And if I had to get up and teach Microsoft Word styles one more time, I was going to like, you know, lose my mind. It was, I was like, this is not working for anybody. Um, I'm not enjoying it. So I know that they're not having as good of experience as they could. And this, you know, sit in a chair, point, click, and that just, it wasn't happening. So I, I started, I went on sort of a quest, I guess, um, to look for something better. And so mm -hmm. as I started exploring, I was looking at different emerging technologies. I was, you know, I was just out there looking like, what's, what's going on? And I'd always loved games. I'd helped, um, I'd helped friends in the past who had developed board games. So I had a lot of sort of history with that and then i said you know what there's some stuff here and it was like this was like more than a decade ago there started to be these like little hints that maybe there's something here for education and um you know there started to be a little bit of buzz but there was so little buzz in fact that i went back to grad school at one point and i pitched a project to one of my professors about gamification i wanted to do i wanted to talk about how you could use gamification to help knowledge workers specifically, because mm -hmm. that was kind of my space. And he was just like, um, no, there's nothing yeah. there. There's not enough, <laughs> there's not enough thing. there to like, yeah. and I was like, well, kind of, I mean, in my, to myself, I'm like, isn't that kind of the point of why we like research things and we like right. invest, I don't know, but anyway, but you know, it was, it was what it was, but that's, uh, I think that's how you know you, you have an idea you need to follow because it didn't care that he turned it down. I went and did it anyway. I did something else for that project and whatever. And then, you know, I said, you know, I'm going to continue doing this. So I just started experimenting with little tiny things. And I tell people that's how you really can start. It doesn't have to be, people think they have to like build this like full scale simulation thing or something on the first go. And mm -hmm. I'm like, you're not going to build Fortnite. You're not, you know, like, <laughs> or World of Warcraft back when I was, when I started, it was World of Warcraft was the example everybody gave. Um, I was like, that's not, that's not what you need to be doing. It's like, let's, let's just learn from the games. Let's find out there's something here that's making people play games. Like they're not, they're not, you know, they're not stopping to check their email. They're not, you know, going and doing other stuff. If they're, playing a game they're in it if it's a good mm -hmm. game mm -hmm. i mean good design is good design if it's right. a bad game then it's still a bad game but so i just i was like i was fascinated by this and i just you know and then i started kind of talking to people like i'm doing today and i'm like hey look there's some cool stuff here you know and some people were kind of like no and some people were like oh that's kind of interesting uh you know and eventually it kind of just took on a life it kind of became part of who I, who I was and what I was doing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I love it. I, I, you know, one of the things I love about this sector, I can't run, I don't like using the word industry, right? But this, the sector, especially education is how people stumble into where they are. And I think that we find that across yeah. all, all paths in life. I mean, I, I worked in a very, very different part of the universe for a, for about 15 years. And that was one of the key conversations was, Hey, how did you get into this business? Right. And everybody's answer was, well, I was supposed to be a lawyer, but then I went to the Peace Corps and then I did that, you know, and they're like, oh, and here I am in Botswana then because that's what I'm supposed to do now. And yeah. it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, and so I, I love hearing those stories as well about how we stumble to where we are. But then, you know, 
if you continue to persist, ask those questions, you know, and, and shine a light, you know, you can really find yourself in a good place. Um, I want to remind everyone who is listening right now that I'm here with Valerie with Y. I'm just going to keep saying it just because I love that brand. Uh, who is going to talk to us about, you know, we're going to, we're, we're talking about gamification and, and while it may seem like old hat with micro learning and, you know, blah, blah, blah out there, that gamification still is a really, really powerful tool um, to put into your e-learning design. And it's something that can, you know, yield some really serious results. Put a comment in, you know, if you're watching on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, put a comment in the, in the chat. We do see them, happy to respond. Even if it's just an observation, we'd love to know what you're thinking out there. Um, You've been doing gamification forever, but how, like, like did, did, um, by the way, before we get started, I want to say, ooh, how do I say that? her name? Lisi Jarve. Fantastic. I hope you're not the only person watching it live. <laughs> we'll see. But if you are, hey. welcome to the audience of one. Um, but Valerie, how did having, you know, like this gamification background and being able to look at things through a gamification lens, how has that helped you over the last 20 months in this pandemic? Like, has that been a, has that been a thing? It has been, a, it, it has been a thing. And I, I was very, into, I was very intentional about it in some ways um, because I, I do I do think that I should sort of model things I'm trying to get people to do. I don't like to be like, oh, you should go and you should go and try this gamification thing. Um, so I did I did a few things and I realized they were definitely specifically a result of coming for that mindset. I mean, at first is the first thing with gamification is it's just keep going, keep going, mm -hmm. you know, try it again. Um, if that's not working, you're going to have to adjust. You're like, you know, you try a strategy in a game and it doesn't work. You got to adjust. Okay, let's let's do that. So some of it was just that inherent sort of, okay, this is a challenge. It's like, you know, it's like any good game. It's, it's a challenge. Okay, we've got a new challenge and we've got some certain limitations which play well with my my creative problem solving sort of part of my brain. And so I was like, okay, limitations can really bring about some interesting results. So we just, mm -hmm. we're going to lean into that. We're going to kind of play with that. That was part of it was just once you start to look at things through a gamification lens where you're like, okay, everything is not written in stone. Everything, you know, try it again. Failure is, failure is the opportunity to try again. It's the, you know, try it again, try it again, reset you know, put in another quarter. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it's like once you kind of, you, you kind of get over that fear factor of failure. I think that's part of it is it's not going to be perfect. Um, your gamification designs aren't going to be perfect on the first mm -hmm. try. It's all about iterating. And, you know, so when you start with that and when you also, I do play, I do encourage people who want to do this to play games, not because they're going to create games necessarily. They could I'm not saying you're not going to, but you you can be full on gamification and not be creating games or playing sure. games in the classroom. So I was like, but once you start looking at it that way, you start looking at the learner differently, you start putting them position differently. And so I was kind of like, okay, I'm the player and like, what are we doing? So that was part of it. And then part of it, I legitimately, I went back and I started playing or playing might not be the word. I started going through season one of Zombies Run. Mm. which is by far still one of my all-time favorite examples when people say, show me what a good gamification system looks like. Show me what, and I love it because I think it highlights pieces of gamification that we miss in most of the gamification things we do, especially in corporate settings mm -hmm. where people are still very much points, badges, leaderboards, and, you know, and, and I get it. An LMS can only do certain things easily. Those are mm -hmm. measurable. Those are, you mm -hmm. know, I can put those variables into a system and it's easy to spit out, you know, a badge or something. But in something like Zombies Run, first of all, it's all based on the narrative. And that's okay. an element that is so crucial. And again, you don't have to be even creating gamifi gamified learning. Just if you're creating learning, um, the use of story, the use of narrative, connecting the, the learner and the player with a story with a challenge with all those things that just to me was like okay i'm now you know <laughs> part of this thing and i did it because i used to commute as i said at the beginning i used to commute into into new york city 
And so my routine in the morning was ride the bus, walk from the bus station to my office, and then in the evening in reverse. So I had these periods of time where I was normally walking. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm not a big runner. I don't claim to be a big runner. But when we all got sent home, I said, you know what? I'm going to keep that same pattern. I'm going to adopt. I'm going to gamify this. And I am going to get up and I would go for a walk in my neighborhood at the same time that I normally would do it. So it helped with the routine. So again, it sort of created... I sort of created a pathway for myself, which again, another big gamification thing, lead them gently through, through the journey. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I, I sort of repackaged my day and I would at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, I would have my walk as I always did. And it was like a huge, a huge help to me. It provided Mm -hmm. some structure um, just like, you know, a game does, a game gives you rules, it gives you structure and then you play within those rules. So it was things like that. I think that really, um, really did help. And, and, and so again, you know, I just, to me, I was like, okay, this sucks. Like everybody, <laughs> this sucks, but like, you know, let's, let's find that, let's find the lessons in it. Let's, you know, keep trying some different things. So those were some of the things that I did and they worked. So, Fantastic. Yeah. And I also love the, you know, the potential analogy, and tell me if you agree with this, of, you know, taking that really just sort of dry compliance training or, you know, something that maybe people don't want to do. And let's not say like spice it up, jazz it up, you know, give it, give it some, give it some flavor so that it then actually becomes, all right, it's not gonna become wonderful, but at least, you know, you're, you're, you're going to not detest the experience, right? Like we've yeah. all been there. We've all been there. And I just love the, I, I love the idea of saying, how can we just, you know, do that one degree shift and yeah. take us somewhere yeah. else? Yeah. I mean, I think the only thing I would, I would slightly disagree with there is I don't want to just make it not unbearable. Um, I think with compliance training, it's a, a lot of times it's really, and the narrative is huge for this, a lot of times is giving it meaning, giving it meaning to the to the individual so that they can find something in it. And sometimes that is just a matter of, okay, it's compliance training, so maybe there's a villain and I have to figure out how to overcome this obstacle, this, I have to beat the villain, or I have to help somebody, um, you know, maybe it's like cyber risk training or something. Mm-hmm. And, you know, mm-hmm. instead of just, okay, don't do this, don't click that, listen to this, read that. If it's, you know, if you can create a storyline for them where maybe somebody's gotten in trouble, somebody's gotten the business in trouble because of some, some phishing attack or something like that, and you can get them to care mm-hmm. about it. You mm-hmm. can give them a meaning. Why am I, okay. Oh, okay. That, wow, that really could have happened to me or that could have, you know, like, how would you help your coworker if, you know, a lot of times it's, I want to get them past whenever possible. I want to get them past, you know, this just doesn't suck so much to, you know, to, to legitimately like having some, having some, having some meaning to it. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and again, that's where we get in trouble with a lot of the, uh, the typical gamification elements is, it's just like, okay, I, I I gave you 10,000 points, Steven. Like, you know, like, Great. What? Well, yeah, so what's that say, mean? Like, you know, what is... like t- take me. Like, I would, I'd love it if you have maybe a specific example that you can share of. You know, if I'm a teacher, professor, trainer right now, thinking about how I inject this into my course or my, you know, m- the class that I have. Most of us think, like you said, badges or you know, hey, there's got to be some sort of quiz or you know, or some sort of actual game we play. What other, what, what are some of those yeah. misconceptions that people have, and what are other, you know, alternatives to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm not saying don't ever use the points badges and leaderboards because they have their, they have their place, but use them purposefully. So, like a leaderboard, leaderboards are tricky um, because if it's just based on points somebody somebody like zooms to the top and gets a bunch of points like nobody else wants to play then it's like i don't want to play with you there's no point to playing with this but if it's a leaderboard that is more like maybe a team competition so it's what am i trying to accomplish in the learning what are the what are the goals and it's not just learning objectives because sometimes there's like multiple layers there's always like what is the individual's goal like why are they there why do they care what's their motivate, you know, to get to their motivation. Then there's like the learning objectives. Okay. These are things, these are behaviors we're trying to change. And then there's the gamification level, which quite often is, is kind of a, uh, an overarching, 
there might be learning objectives, but I also am building the team. So the gamification piece might not be directed at specifically a learning objective. It might be we're going to build a team competition. And so mm -hmm. then maybe a leaderboard is a good idea because now it has some meaning. It, it fits in with the whole, you know, we have to look at it a little more holistically. Um, you know, I might, I might care more that way. Um, but yeah, I think in general, if you're starting out, a couple of things to think about are always making sure you have some way to make progress visible. Now that could be a badge or something, but it could just be the way you're structuring your content. You could be giving them um, a map, literally something that, okay, I'm going to explore these topics. Um, and it gives them a visual of their progress because there's nothing more compelling and motivating than somebody seeing that they're making progress. Mm -hmm. um, Cause learning, we, we, we teach scaffolding and learning like it's a bunch of steps. Like you just right. go up this step and you go up this step. And it's not, right? Mm -hmm. None of us learn that way. We learn like this. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> you know, you learn something and then you forget part of it. And then you go back. And then you... so anytime you can, you can sort of ground them in breaking things into smaller pieces so that it feels achievable. That's another big game thing. People will keep playing a game as long as they think there's the possibility of winning. They're going to stop if they're like, this game's not fair um, or it's boring or whatever. But if they think there's an opportunity to advance, they will. Mm -hmm. They'll, they're, they're more likely to keep going. So I like things like visual metaphors like that to kind of show them and not just show them where they're going, but remind them where they've been. Remind them of something that was really hard at the beginning mm -hmm. and now they can do. Sometimes, sometimes it's okay to throw them a, throw them an easy question now and then. Um, we get very siloed in our, in our training quite often. If you're developing e-learning modules, we keep the questions. This is module three. I will ask you questions about module three. Sure. Mm -hmm. well, what about throwing in a question from module one? Like, mm -hmm. let them feel that, let them feel that sense of accomplishment, remind them. Um, you know, it's also spaced repetition. It feeds into a lot of the, a lot of the good practices. But like again, it can be something as something that little as how you're presenting it. I've seen magical things with checklist, mm -hmm. where somebody just because they could see where they were going, what they needed to do, um, can make a big difference. Particularly in a workplace environment, if you have them doing things that maybe they can or have to do out of order, that gets very disorienting. But if I have, you know, a nice little graphic that I can like, oh, okay, I finished these things. Or um, another one I use a lot is, does everybody need to know everything? Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe they don't. Maybe there's some, maybe there's some chance. One of my favorite um, gamification elements, we'll call it, uh, is choice. So can I give people a choice, like how they're going to do the activity or the order they're doing it, or maybe, maybe certain topics, I need you to be five stars. I need you to know everything you need to know about this, but maybe some other topic, you only need to earn three stars because mm -hmm. you just need familiarity with it. It's not something that you're going to use right now. So I would say for somebody starting out, like find those places where you can provide them some choice. They're adults. They need autonomy. And when you try to box them in too much, that's when they start stressing and, you know, they're going to resist. They're going to resist that. So choice, I would say, definitely. If you can position it as a challenge, I mean, make it, make it, make it so that they're, that they're achieving something. They see that they're achieving something. Breaking things into challenges can be very powerful. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, and again, the, the, the make progress visible. I mean, it's the difference of like, I always, I have my, I have my wearable, you know, my wearable on to count my steps. And it's very interesting because I've, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of people on this and even my, even my elderly mother, she knew after she got out of rehab after a car accident, she needed to walk, but it's easy to say, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's raining. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's whatever. We can make a thousand excuses. But when you can see it, when you can look at the little chart and you can watch that you did it, it's totally different. It is a totally different mindset. And so, yeah, I think those are those are um, and surprise. I, I th throw some little throw some little things I, in there to surprise them. You, 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 you almost kind of foreshadowed my question there because my question is about foreshadowing. How do you 
prime or um, foreshadow or let the learner know what might be coming down the pipe using unification. Like I, for me, that's always a big thing where it's kind of like, that's the cliffhanger in the movie, right? Cause you're like, Oh, this is got something's going to happen, but I'm not sure what, you know, like, how do you, how do you do that? Yeah. Well, I think, I think you have a couple of, you have a couple of simple tools depending on what type of learning you're doing. Um, your cliffhanger. I mean, just doing that alone, the end of, you know, the end of a, a session or whatever, leaving them with some compelling question, the brain, the brain can't help but try to answer a question. You, you just can't. The brain cannot. It cannot ignore a question. <laughs> it's like, it's like, really, it's did you ignore the impossible. fact that I said that? No, of course not. Your head is like going, oh, I have to, like, questions are magic. Questions, um, you know, and I love that. That's something else that games do really well that we sometimes don't do as well in learning. Like, ask the question first. Dump them right into whatever it is. Dump them into the problem. Give them mm -hmm. the question. Don't give them the solution first let them discover the solution so that's part of the foreshadowing is give them the give them the problem let them kind of wrestle with it a little bit and then okay what information would i need to solve this or what tools would i need to solve this so sometimes it's it's flipping the uh it's sort of flipping the script in a way get them get them hooked with the question or put them into like dump them into the scenario that's one way you can do the foreshadowing um, Another way, if you're doing like e-learning, if you're doing something that's got definitely that kind of a visual thing, look at what games do. When mm -hmm. you have, you'll have like things kind of, kind of grayed out in the background. You'll get a sort of hint of what the next, um, the next challenge is going to be about, or you'll get a hint of, you know. So you'll have like I'm going through things again, the sort of mapping idea. It's very clear I'm going through the steps, but oh, okay, I see there's going to be like six pieces over here, and I have to. I'm going to have to figure out what those are. So yeah, that little sense of mystery that you can you can leave those little breadcrumbs to kind of give them. Uh, any of those things can be very, um, very compelling. And just, you know, again, simple things uh, that, that can that can really shift shift it and uh, mm. make it a much better, much better experience. So the aesthetics, looking at the aesthetics of it, um, not to be, you know, just, oh, it's all about if it's pretty. Um, not bad that if it's pretty, but what are you using to prime them as you said like what little hints for everybody who's listening right now including our friend lee c over there um you know we are live right now it, we're, we're recording this on february 15th here in the year 2022 if you do have a question you have an observation or um you know a comment or you know a challenge put it in the comments there in facebook or youtube or linkedin we'd love to hear them and if you're listening to the recording of this uh, either on our podcast or you know on one of those platforms come and put a question in any way because we still get them and we you know we'd love to you know engender that conversation as well um i also want to give a shout out to everyone as well we're talking about a critical design component within the e-learning universe gamification right now with valerie with a y God, i love that um so i you know that it just just so happens that in eight days on february 23rd is our first session of the e learn success series uh which is a free um, four-part uh, virtual series that we're, we're putting on this year. A lot of people know that we did the e-learning success summit the last two years. We've broken it into four parts. Our first session's on February 23rd, and it's focused entirely on, you guessed it, design and uh, how we can make that learning experience more engaging and better. So my next question for you, Valerie, is gamification, there's, there's this, a lot of times there's this reward component. And you've been talking a lot about the learning itself or the advancing myself or seeing the achievement or whatever is the reward. Where do you stand on rewards? You know, like uh, everything from the badge to actual swag that shows up, you know, in your physical mailbox. Like, talk to me about that. Okay. So, so I, I first of all, as I often do, I think we need to redefine or clarify what we mean by reward. Mm -hmm. because strictly speaking, reward means feedback. I take an action, I get a reaction. Um, and so that piece of rewards, I love. Um, think about when you play a game, you get instant feedback. You get, you know, you roll the dice, you know how many spaces to move. You make a, you know, you play a game and you something happens. So in that sense, I think if we can focus more on how we deliver good quality feedback in a timely fashion, 
I'm all in. I'm all in. Okay. I'll take that any day. Also, if we can if we can focus on sort of the praise factor, um, whether that's um, you know recognition from the instructor, whether that's giving some sort of peer recognition, those are all reward structures that are underutilized. Um, you know, most managers think that they that they reward and praise their employees much higher percentage than employees would say. Um, hmm. that they feel they receive the praise and recognition and things like that. So I think in games, that's great. I mean, and that's like sort of, it's sort of in that leaderboard spirit of like, you know, wrecking, but recognize people, recognize somebody who really, you know, came on strong this week or made some, you know, great comments in your, in your course or, you know, those kind of things I think are great. Now, as far as like points and badges and things like that, I'm not against them. I'm not against them, but they have to be structured to mean something. They have to represent an accomplishment and not just I showed up. Like mm. if it's that, oh, you clicked the button, you went into the course, you get a badge. <laughs> like that doesn't mean anything to the learner. And they and they catch on pretty quickly that like this is, you know, this isn't meaningful. This doesn't mm -hmm. mean anything to me. Mm -hmm. But if it's tied to something, um, like even if it's points, um, there's the, there's the there's the really good example from the George Clooney movie Up in the Air where he talks about like his frequent flyer miles, um, and he's he wants to get to a certain number, and and she's like looking at she's like, isn't that okay? Like she's like, mm -hmm. that's an interesting, you know? Okay, whatever. But then when he says he says, I'd be the seventh person to do it more people have walked on the moon. Like then yeah, you're like, sure. you, you have that moment of like, this means something like yeah. it has some relevance to him. Now it doesn't have to have relevance to everybody, but it has relevance to him. And that's where you really have to iterate and you have to know your audience and not just throw a design out there and say, well, I like, I like badges or I like whatever. Um, I'm not a big fan of leaderboards, but I'll design them into a, into a session if that's what works for that audience. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think that's, that's where it gets tricky. People, people want to make it absolute. Like you like rewards, you hate rewards. You want to give prizes or you don't want to give prizes. And I think it matters. It just, it depends. You have to look at your specific situation and who you are dealing with. Um, you know, there's a, there's an old example of uh, some, I think it was a tech company that gave these big prizes. They were given away, it was like manager training. And they had the prize was like this retreat, this weekend retreat or something. Sounded great. Like, you know, you're not, you're like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Send me to the resort, send me whatever. And, but they had sort of not looked at who was in these management training programs and why they were in these programs. So you, you had somebody like, let's say a single mother who, the weekend is the only time she has to really spend with her kids and take them to the park and right. do mm -hmm. those things. And now you're telling her that she has to choose between the weekend with her kids or going on this resort, you know, trip with the, the team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now she feels like, oh, if I don't go do this, I'm not going to get the promotion or, you know, it puts, it puts that person in an awkward position and they worked really hard at the course. And so like, it has to be an alignment with, something that makes sense and not just like, here's a, you know, here's a prize. Here's a, you know, well, I mean, for that, in, in, that, that speaks to, you know, have different prizes for different people or give them exactly. a choice. Right? In terms of, like for that particular woman, you know, a, a day or two off, you know, graphic, exactly. it would have been exactly. a much better choice. Probably. I don't know. You know yeah. And that's it. The cho but, the, but that again, you gave, you give them some freedom, give them some autonomy to feel appreciated and feel rewarded, but not in a way that, is 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 not helpful um mm. and also i'm not against i will admit i'm not against there's sort of the sometimes you have to throw the the, the reward out there like you have to have the deadline sure. intrinsic motivation is great and that's where we would love everybody to be we want everybody to learn we want everybody to be as excited about the subjects as we are and that's not reality of course and also it's just you know deadlines have to happen and that is an extrinsic motivator that is that is there's nothing intrinsic about it but intrinsic motivation has no deadline mm -hmm. so if you just kind of let people explore forever you never get to the result so you do sometimes have to nudge them 
Um, so if you know the first 50 people to complete this or you know you want to set up some sort of gameful competitive thing uh and again if i'm if i'm if i'm teaching salespeople, they live and breathe competition like it would not make sense not to have something competitive about it but if i'm teaching a course on team building competition might not be my best move there <laughs> because mm -hmm. i'm that would be counter to what i'm trying that would be counter to the behaviors that I'm trying to, you know, get them to participate in. So you do, I think you have to, you have to take it. Um, and I know people want, they want a formula. They want, do this, do this, and this will happen. Right, um, right. But we're dealing with people and people don't, people don't function that way. We're not, we're not programmable humans. in that way. <laughs> yeah, humans are messy. We are. So then my next question for you is, you know, um, we all know, like, I, I think there's a classic story of, you know, the baby or the child learns by doing, right? They fall over, they do, you know, they do it a thousand times, that's how they learn and walk. They don't realize they're learning during that process, right? Yeah, you don't exactly. learn, you don't realize you're learning a language as you're learning it as a child. Yeah. So where and how do you, like, describe or work with clients in that, you know, we're learning, but we're not, that's how we're going to design it, versus... Yeah. Hey, we're going to, you know, here's the three things that you got to get out of this and we're going to try to make it a little fun. Like, do you, is there, is, again, is that just another spectrum for you or can you make clear choices there? Um, yeah, I think, I think, I think most of these things are still sort of spectrum for me, but in a case like that, um, if it's a knowledge type thing, there's going to have to be built in some, some repetition of it. So that might be a place where I want to go a little more playful, a little more gameful, just to kind of, because they need that, they need that repetition. They need the, you know, that sort of, that sort of uh, behavior. If it's, if it's something that's more um, developing a hard, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a good, a good example, um, but you know, not a knowledge thing. It's more of the, it's more just the behavior thing. Then you could still go with, I, I still want to go with something generally that is maybe scenarios so mm -hmm. that it's fresh. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's a part of it. It's just, you don't want to put people in a situation where they're doing the exact same thing over and over and over. So even if it's randomizing questions, at least then there's that mystery factor of, I don't know which one's going to come up. Um, uh, scenarios are like, just stellar and you know and, and we could have a whole hour talking about you know is that a game is it not a game is right. it a, mm -hmm. i don't care i don't care mm -hmm. if people think it's a game or don't think it's a game it's like is that the right method to get them where they're going um so yeah i would say you know scenarios are are, are a big a, a big winner because they do give you that and a good scenario the, the really the really i think the the mark of a good scenario based experience is if you get through it correctly and you go play it again Ooh. because you want to see what could have happened mm -hmm. it has to have it has to have that if it's if it's structured really well you'll get that replay factor which is when you know you've hit like you've hit gold on that one mm -hmm. because that is where the learning really happens because if they got through it right on the first time First of all, they're not going to have fun. That's not mm -hmm. even going to be fun for somebody because it means they already knew it. But if you can create enough intrigue or you can show that there could have been a serious enough uh, outcome if they had made a mistake, then they're going to want to go back. Like military training is big on that. Like if you can get through the scenario right the first time, a lot of times they'll go back and play it because I need to know what I could screw up. <laughs> it's important for me to know. So. Um, yeah, it's always contextual, but yeah, I, I don't have a problem with, 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 again, making it feel gameful in that way, in the replay factor. Um, but what you don't want is, I don't want somebody to, somebody described it to me at a session one time that she's like, she's like, okay, I think I like what you're saying about gamification, but what I've experienced is I'm learning how to scuba dive. And then somebody goes, here's some cotton candy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that type of, I'm just going to throw a game in here so that you like take a break so that you, you know, keep playing. So you, whatever, then, then no, I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to do that. 
I don't want anybody to do that. What? How, so <laughs> that that begs the question of like sort of first of all, why does that happen so often, right? Um, you know, why is it that we we are learning scuba diving and then we see you know cotton candy show up? What and what are the ways like you said it at the very beginning of our talk? You know, there's some simple ways to get into this, but let's reiterate those right now. Like, how would you suggest if I'm again, if I'm either just new to the learning profession, I'm a professor that you know tech isn't my thing. Um, even, you know, sort of, look, I'm, you know, I do astrophysics, like, you know, thinking about how to gamify something. Is not my, is not my shtick? Like, what do I, where do I start? Do I call somebody else or is there something really simple I can do? Well, yeah. I mean, if you can call somebody else, that's, that's never a bad, that's never a bad answer to get a second, you know, get a second brain. I would, I'd love to have just a second brain that I can, you know, call on. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think first of all is to take a breath and not not set limitations and expectations on yourself that your gamification has to look like something else you've seen. Um, that's the first thing. Cause you could, we could, I could give, I could give five people a challenge to design something, some type of course, they could do five different variations. They could all be equally good and look nothing alike. And some of them could have a lot of tech. Some of them could have no tech. Um, you know, you can do, you can do a lot of people, uh, especially higher eds kind of really jumped on it. Uh, definitely K-12 and even incorporate the escape room idea. Um, mm. You know, oh my gosh. My, I mean, that's like taking off like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so you know, those kind of things. And there's templates out there. There's templates out there where you can just kind of drop in your, you know, your content um, and take them on a journey. And and there's nothing wrong with that. That's that's a fair way to do it. I would say start small. Find one thing. Don't try to gamify your whole world. You know, don't try to gamify the whole semester or the whole course. Find one little thing um, and experiment with it. And you're going to have to be patient with yourself and understand that you're going to have to try things because, and that makes people uncomfortable because they just want it one and done. And that's not generally uh, how it's going to work with gamification um, because, again, people, messy, you got to try and kind of play with it and really get to know, get to know your players. And that's the other thing is think about not just the demographic. Um, you know, oh, I have this many students and there's this many males and females and this and that. But what matters to them? Why, why do they care? What would they do if they were learning something? One of my favorite questions, if they were learning something on their own, how would they do it? Right. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. would they, would they call a friend? Maybe mm -hmm. they get another brain. <laughs> you know, how would they do it? Would they read something? Would they watch a video? So start small, but, but find those opportunities to provide choice. That's again, if you can do nothing else, find an opportunity to give people choice. And that could be as simple as, um, you know, two ways to complete the activity. You can do sort of the traditional route. You can answer these questions to show that you have read the material and you understand it, whatever, or give them an option that lets them be a little more creative, lets them express themselves a little bit. Self-expression is another huge thing that we don't always leverage and sometimes we don't have the opportunity that's harder to do in an e-learning module than it is you know some other settings so definitely choice try to work some story into it okay you're an astro you're the astrophysics professor again don't come in and teach them formulas mm -hmm. come in and tell them that a supernova has just exploded at these coordinates and we have to form the team to gather the data and i'm rusty on my astrophysics but you know <laughs> uh, you know create the sun shield that will protect us yes, from the the sun shield. there you go there you go and so you create you know break them into teams and they each have their own assignments you're the data scientist and you're the you know the this person and maybe you're the pr person that has to like communicate with the general public about the dangers of this again it's a little thing and people go, oh, I'm not creative. Sure you are. Mm -hmm. Sure you are. Or talk it out with talk it out with somebody. Um, those kind of things, just putting them in uh, a situation like that. It's still the same content. They're still going to have to learn the formulas. They still have to learn all the, uh, you know, all the how the equipment works and, you know, all that, you know, sure. the tele all the fancy buttons on those new telescopes that are like command stations. Now they still have to learn that, but now you've given them a context to learn it in. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we would call that, I guess, problem-based learning if we were 
if we were going to be, uh, I guess that's more, that's more K-12 use that terminology, but you know, it's that idea, like put them in a, put them in a situation. So I think, I think definitely choice story, creating small challenges, um, questions, use your questions better, use your questions better. Um, instructors like to talk <laughs> mm -hmm. and sometimes we just have to shut up. Sometimes we have to be quiet because the learning doesn't happen while we're talking. Mm -hmm. I know we think it does. It doesn't. <laughs> so we have to be, okay, ask the question and let them go and play with it and think about it and explore it a little bit. So um, I think that's, I think that's some, some pretty simple things that, that people can start with and, uh, you know, and build from there. Valerie with a Y, I have a final question for you. I ask this for everybody on the hot seat in the podcast, depending on where you're listening to this, which is what are you most excited about? Where do you think, see things going in gamification or anywhere else over the next sort of 6, 12, 18 months in the near future? What's, what's, what are you excited about? I think I'm excited about, about some of the technologies that are coming out that are not specifically gamification, but they are playful. There's, there's a movement to creating better design. Um, mm. uh, there's, there's a movement to getting us out of the Zoom box. Um, you know, I've been, I've been exploring a lot with the platform Topia lately, which is a spatial chat for if, if people haven't tried it yet. It's a spatial chat mm. platform. And um, there's, some interesting, there's some interesting insights coming out of it. People have tended to want to stay in sessions a lot longer. They're not like mm -hmm. running away with Zoom fatigue and all those kind of things. And again, it's immersive. That's the other thing. It puts people into an environment. It's like, it's like I dropped you into a video game and I could make that, I could make that environment. So we could be in the laboratory. I could have the astrophysics lab right there. And we could literally have our little character walking around the lab and we could be talking to one another. And so I'm very intrigued by, I'm very intrigued by things like that, which are kind of, you know, people are getting excited, a little more excited about purposeful. And I keep using that word because AR has been around for a very long time. And it's, it's, it's getting past the, oh, this is fun. This is a novel thing. Let's, let's take a look at this. But I think some of these technologies are starting to leverage um, some of the best of those, uh, taking advantage of it being playful, immersive, and things like that. So I'm very excited about that. And I'm just, my goal is that eventually some of these words, we won't even, I won't be talking about gamification. I'll be talking about good design. And you have people coming up talking about that at the at the, at the uh, oh look at you session look at you but, set me up that's fantastic but yeah but i mean no but i'm excited about it because it is yeah. it, it really it's all about good design and that's that's what that's what makes the difference and so it doesn't have to be flashy it doesn't have to be fancy i've done i've done many gamification things on pen and paper with pen and paper or Absolutely. you know some cards mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be um I, I don't want people to be afraid of it i want people to but you really just have to dive in and try it there's no, this is not, this is like a bicycle. You're never going to learn to ride it by just sitting there watching somebody else ride. You got to get in there and try it. Awesome. Valerie with a Y and that's Valerie with a Y.com at Valerie with a Y. This has been an absolutely fantastic conversation about gamification in the online learning space or the e-learning space. Can't thank you enough for taking the time for being with us today. It was a um, again, if anybody's listening live, um, or listening to the recording, you can put a question in Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube there. We do see them afterwards if you're listening to the recording. Thanks again for tuning into today's episode of the eLearning Podcast. If you like what you heard, please do me the favor of following us on LinkedIn, Twitter, or whichever social media you prefer. Also, if you're interested in diving deeper on eLearning, I encourage you to get your free ticket to the eLearning Success Summit, where there are more than 70 hours of presentations on best practices. Just go to elearningsuccesssummit.com. And then finally, for the latest news, information, and resources about eLearning, come subscribe to our newsletter at lmspulse.com. Thanks.